so good evening all of you welcome to the covid week uh, in today's talk we have uh, experienced speaker dr vishal kumar chitikeshi uh, he is an pulmonologist and physician uh, who is working at aig hospital hyderabad uh, he is an md from jitma and he has extensive experience in doing chest ultrasound bronchoscopy even like lung transplant and he has been a member of european respiratory society american college of chest physicians indian chest association and indian medical association uh, he will be sharing his experience uh, from inside the covid ward how he has been dealing with the patient and uh, i suggest that uh, we listen to him first and keep our question typed in the question answer box and after his seminar we will uh, request him to answer some of these questions so let's welcome dr vishal kumar yes please, please thank you sir thank you iit kanpur for giving me this opportunity uh, so it's uh, i feel very happy whenever we get an opportunity to share our knowledge which would help the non professional uh, non i would say non uh, other than this medical profession it will it would help in creating awareness and taking some initiatives uh, uh, through their uh, field so today's topic is uh, uh, covid 19 management from the perspective of a non professional caregiver i would mainly focus on what would be our management strategies for uh, covid uh, in mild moderate and severe cases and what has been the evidence for so many medications which are been on the chart uh, for the last one year and uh, i will also be telling about uh, the some of the i mean focusing on the symptoms and uh, also some of the newer medications which are going to come in the near future which are having some emerging role so covid 19 we are again talking about this topic which we already thought that this was over in january or february when the vaccination drive has come and started exporting the vaccine rather than uh, uh, holding for the country so why this happened is so we are already in the second wave this is the main reason why we are uh, talking about covid 19 again and uh, this is almost like a tsunami why because there it's the number of cases and the infectivity of this second wave is like i feel it's easily 3 to 4 times more than the first wave why uh, we are again falling short of beds this time even oxygen shortage everywhere is the high infectivity and more severity of the disease the infectivity i would say is definitely very very high compared to the first wave we are noticing all the family members getting affected in this way if one positive person gets detected there is an increase incidence in the younger population because i feel there are less precautions by this population and by this age group they they tend to have more activities which are unnecessary compared to the older group and also partly by vaccination which was mostly focused to the plus 60 or plus 45 with comorbidities there is a contrast in the symptom which is the fever in the second wave uh, i am using every possible medication to reduce the fever in the second wave because there is a persistent fever even more than what we see in dengue what would be the possible factors leading to this tsunami or a complacent behavior among the public state and also the government we declared it too early and almost we opened up everything without uh, adequate vaccination and uh, there is probably a part, partly this was public and from the from our side and uh, partly from the virus side also there might be a mutant there are already mutant viruses which are spreading very fast and vaccine drive could not catch up with the rate of active infection this everybody agrees so 
the symptoms as we all know there is no new symptom pertaining to the covid 19 the list of the symptoms are almost the same the majority of them having fever cough and this time cold and headache is also very common also we know that in the late cases we have shortness of breath chills myalgias sore throat the frequency of this sore throat and common cold like uh, uh, presentation is very common in second wave. Many of them think that it's just the common cold that may not be COVID, but they later turn up to be COVID. And nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is, I feel the frequency is the same like the first wave because COVID can affect both the respiratory tract and the GI tract. So I just want to have to focus one point here. Many of the patients think that having only fever is not COVID unless it is not combined with having cough or any other respiratory symptom. Patient can have isolated symptom or a combination of symptoms. Any of these symptoms is proven is COVID unless otherwise proven. So they have to get tested as soon as they experience any of this, but the major, but the major step they have to take is first they have to get isolated because in the meantime, they can infect other people. So in pertaining to second wave, it's a persistent fever or more than 100 degrees lasting for more than seven days is the most contrasting feature from the first wave. So a little bit on the diagnostics, as we all know, what is the test we need to do for diagnosing COVID? The most the gold standard test is the RT-PCR test where the swab is put into your nose and the throat and it is put into a viral media and checked for the genetic material of the virus. This is a gold standard test, but it has got its own pros and cons. So the pros is obviously it's a gold standard. It cannot have any other virus mimicking COVID when it's artificial is positive. If it's positive, it's COVID-19 only. But if it's done a little too early or a little late, this test can come negative. But in COVID-19, even if it is done at the right time, it can be negative because the virus may not stay in your nose and throat for a longer time. So false negatives are very common. And if it's too late or too early, then also it could be false negative. So many of the patients think that when the RT-PCR is negative, they may not have COVID. But if they run symptoms, there is if the RT-PCR is negative, there is a high chance the patient is not aware of this point that he will delay his treatment and land up in complications. So RT-PCR has to be done in the first five days. Later days also it can be done. But the interpretation at what point of day is more important. So the other test which is also done with a swab in the nose and throat is the rapid antigen test. The advantage of this rapid antigen test is it gives the diagnosis immediately with the kit and uh, the disadvantage is it's not as sensitive or specific as RT-PCR but if it is positive, it's positive. And if the rapid is positive and the RT-PCR is negative, we still treat the patient as COVID-19 only. But what if this both tests come negative and the patient runs symptoms? So we suggest a repeat RT-PCR at the same time, if at least three days is over from the symptoms or sometimes five days, we do a CT scan of the chest to find out whether this COVID changes are seen in the lungs. So now the nose and throat is over. Now we go to the lungs also to see the viral changes. Here we cannot, here we cannot uh, uh, do a swab test in the lungs because that will be uh, done by only bronchoscopy. So the only way to do the uh, check the lungs for COVID changes is the CT scan of the chest. But the CT scan has its pros and cons. The pros is that it can detect COVID changes even when the RTPs or rapid can are negative. But the um, disadvantages is that if it's done too early, it will not show any changes. If it's done in the first five days, the CT scan can be normal. So CT scan we usually do from day five, at least day five or plus to know the changes of COVID. 
So these are the changes of the COVID. If we, this CT on the left side is done at uh, first five days where it was normal, but the same patient having these changes later, uh, a classical COVID changes because in, at least in the second week of illness. So it's a diagnostic tool and an indicator of lung involvement. As we all know, Corat changes are very common. Excuse me. As you all know, the Corat scoring, this is initiated to have a clear picture of the reports and interpretation since it's a pandemic to make it easier for the physicians to interpret. As if it says Corat 5, the pattern is very classical and it is typical of COVID-19, almost 100% fits into COVID. Corat 4 and 3 are may or may not be, but during a pandemic with the classical symptoms, we, all, we interpret Corat 3 and Corat 5 as also COVID. Corat 1 and Corat 2 are definitely not COVID, but if somebody has Corat 1 and RT-PCR is positive, it just means that the lungs are not yet involved, but lungs may be involved later. But if the RTPCR is negative and it's Corat 1, still has symptoms, so we follow those patients very closely. So nothing is so 100%. We have to interpret the clinical RTPCR rapid antigen report and the CT report together to have a conclusion on COVID-19 diagnosis. So what's the most common confusion is RTPCR is negative, so what? Do you do if the symptoms persist, your doctor should take a call on repeating the RTPCR or a CT scan. But what not to do is if you if, because you should not think that it's negative, so it's not COVID, and because you because you will already spread uh, to your family or friends and have a diagnostic delay and delay treatment causing complications. So RT-PCR positive, isolate yourself immediately. Remember, you can infect other family members. Start the treatment after consulting your doctor. Do not self-medicate. If it's negative, clinical correlation and other tests as per the day of illness. And again, isolate and start the treatment. So what is mild disease is fever not lasting for more than five days. Saturation between always between 95 to 99, which is the normal range. No breathing difficulty may have cough or other symptoms. Managing, how to manage these mild cases at home. So when the symptoms are mild, definitely they can go for home isolation and monitoring their symptoms. In the present scenario, this is the recommended uh, treatment modality that is at home. With mild cases getting admitted, there will be, it, it is not really needed and also there will be huge scarcity of beds to the needy patients. So this is what we advise to mild patients. All they need is a thermometer, an oximeter, pulse oximeter, which shows the pulse rate and saturation, a blood pressure monitor only for those patients who need regular monitoring and for those patients of diabetes, a blood glucose monitor. So this shows both oxygenation and pulse rate. And having a mask at home, or if possible, keep N95 mask self. So they have to have a monitoring chart of temperature, oxygen, PP and sugar, and any new symptoms. I also add another column into my patient's chart that is six minute walk test. Six minute walk test is something, six minute walk test is something that patient walks for six minutes like giving an exercise to their body indirectly to the lungs and checking whether the oxygen stays normal even after six minutes. If there is a this drop in oxygenation after six minutes and the patient at rest oxygen is normal, it means that maybe after two days, their oxygen might go down even at rest. So this is a test to pick up those cases from home who actually need close monitoring and call them up for hospital monitoring. So the frequency of checking of these vitals can be either four hours or six hours, depending on the severity of the symptoms. So always mention the day of illness and monitoring 
plays a crucial part of COVID-19 home management. If this can be done proper and under the supervision of a doctor, then we can prevent a lot of delayed admissions. And by preventing delayed admissions, we are indirectly preventing morbidity and mortality. So self-assessment of overall illness, it helps in understanding the disease and will help treating physician to take the right decision. So basic medication, what do we all need is basically we need paracetamol and multivitamin and other symptomatic medications is what is all needed to manage a mild case at home. Multivitamins and some of the medications which your doctor can prescribe, we will be coming to those uh, topics in a while. Exact dosages and additional medications will be given by your treating physician and do not self-medicate because some of the medications might be contraindicated in your case. So the basic diagnostic tests which we do for mild cases is a CRP and LDH usually done at day three, day two or day three, a hemogram also at day two or day three. At day five, we usually do a ferritin and D-dimer at least once for these mild cases. Only in cases which need HRCT, like symptoms persist even after five days, fever is not coming down. They're having progressive fatigue, progressive weakness, then we advise a CT scan to check whether how much of the lungs are involved to take a call on whether the patient needs hospitalization rather than to be continued at home isolation. So do not wait if you have any symptoms, schedule a RT-PCR test and give samples for CRP and hemogram. I would say day two and day three, repeat the CRP if at all needed and CT only if with doctor's advice if you need CT scan, not everybody needs a CT scan. So I just want to highlight some of the medications which are being prescribed in uh, mild cases. What is the evidence and uh, how much can we rely on these medications? So coming from ivermectin, which is an antiparasite, the proven role is that it prevents the viral entry into the cell and it's an anti-inflammatory. In vitro studies have proven evidence, but in vivo needs better studies, better RCTs. Indian studies have shown a reduction of 73% in prophylactic doses. Like suppose somebody is exposed uh, to a close con contact uh, of a COVID patient. If they take ivermectin even before they develop symptoms, maybe there is a chance that uh, they do not develop active COVID-19 infection. But this has not been proven in a bigger RCTs. And because of the sample size and we need larger studies to give such statements. Therapeutic role has not yet been proven. There is another medication called favipiravir now being produced by n number of companies. So now Ministry of Health and Family Welfare does not recommend it at present. And studies are all smaller sized, mainly from Japan and no strong evidence so far. Inhaled budesonide, there is a study called stoic study with good evidence. It is helping. Normally we use this medication in treating asthma or even post-infective cough or in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But here it is also showing some effect in the antipyretic and recovery of the patient. Since the sample size is less, we need larger studies. And principal study is one thing which is still ongoing from last June. Now ICMR guidelines started recommending taking inhaled budesonide in the home management guidelines. Only fever and cough persist beyond five days. Vitamin C, vitamin D, and NSAIDs are also being prescribed. There is insufficient data for vitamin C either for or against in COVID-19. In critically ill patients, high-dose vitamin C can improve oxygenation. There are studies which have proven it, but still, again, we need larger RCTs. Vitamin D, what is the role of vitamin D? Is there, is, there have been large number of studies in prophylactic role of vitamin D, and high doses of vitamin D has immunomodulatory effect in preventing cytokine storm. This can be easily supplemented in this can be easily supplemented in mild cases. NSAIDs, uh, not, it is an anti-inflammatory for body pains or fever. We never, we actually have have not used in the first first wave, but now even the MHF. Uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is recommending naproxen for persistent fever, but I use mephenemic acid and other medications also to 
uh, give symptomatic relief to the patient if there is persistent fever and body pains. There is another medication called colchicin, uh, which is actually a gout medicine, which is given in gout. But colchicin has very good anti-inflammatory and antiviral property. This actually inhibits NLRP3, uh, which uh, uh, has the uh, prevention role to prevent the further progression of the virus. But there is uh, at present no clear evidence through recovery trial, which is the largest trial. N-acetyl cysteine, this is uh, uh, an antioxidant given in multiple conditions, but in COVID, it has been proven to have antiviral properties, anticoagulant like microthrombi can be prevented and an antioxidant. It has good role in mild to severe cases. This can be recommended. So summarizing treatment in mild cases, it's basically symptomatic treatment that is paracetamol, vitamins, mainly uh, because they are cheap and no harm, readily available. I would recommend vitamins. N-acetyl cysteine, emerging role, but we are already recommending N-acetyl cysteine. Inhaled budesonide also has an emerging role. This needs larger RCTs, maybe months down the line or years down the line, we will have further clarity on these medications. So as we all know how somebody, any, any patient has to be isolated, they have to wear a mask and family members to wear a mask, separate bathroom, uh, dishes have to be separate and they have to be cleaned. Uh, whoever cleans have to wear a mask and wash hands thoroughly. There should be ventilation and do not use common AC. Hydrate well, eat good diet, and uh, basically dehydration has to be avoided. And anything that creates acidity, I ask my patients to avoid and having high protein diet. What are the red flags for patients who should get hospitalization? We always emphasize on the oxygen, oxygen saturation. As long as it's between 95 to 99, I ask the patient to be at home. If there is any drop below 95, sometimes, I mean, I mean for elderly patients, I take 94. If that is dropping below 94, they have to get hospitalized. And if the six minute walk test also shows a drop of more than four, four points, then also please contact the doctor. And if you need any CT scan, the doctor would decide. Extreme fatigue or uh, weakness, persistent fever, more than seven days or breathing trouble for more than 72 hours. Breathing trouble, as soon as they have breathing trouble, I ask my patients to check the level of lung infection and get hospitalized. Sometimes we need to differentiate between anxiety-related breathing issue and a real breathing issue. Sudden drop in blood pressure also in some patients and sudden confusion or uh, a syncopal attack. We are having different types of uh, presentation in these sick patients who are getting hospitalized. Importance of timely hospitalization is we can prevent all the complications if they get admitted at the right time. And this will reduce the hospital stay. And this will also free up beds quickly for others to get access. What is moderate COVID-19 is persistent fever for more than five days, an SPO2 less than 94, patient having shortness of breath, CT severity of 8 by 25, more than 8 by 25, and respiratory rate more than 24. A severe COVID-19 is SPO2 less than 90, respiratory rate more than 30, and severe shortness of breath. So I will briefly tell the medications being used in this moderate to severe COVID-19 and what is exactly the evidence tell us. The first one, which is this antiviral medication, which is remdesivir, uh, being manufactured by many companies initially by hetero. It is definitely not a life-saving drug. Only it has a role only in the first few days of illness, and that too, when the patient is having persistent fever, we notice a symptomatic relief and fever comes down with this medication. But somebody is getting admitted in critical state, definitely there is, I feel there is definitely no benefit of uh, remdesivir, and uh, there have to be uh, steps taken by um, authorities or uh, guidelines not to give, but at least to save uh, cost and uh, uh, unnecessary panic going on. Uh, 
so your doctor is the best judge he has to be aware when exactly this drug works dexamethasone or methylprednisolone this is a steroid this plays a good role in patients who are falling oxygen and especially in the second week not all patients improve definitely improve with uh, steroid it depends on the severity of illness if there is a hyper inflammatory response and steroids are started just after this inflammation settled in uh, not too late definitely patients are going to improve this has to be taken only after consultation with the doctor about the right dosages there is a lot of misuse happening at, even in mild cases uh, just by panic this should should be discontinued only after consultation with your doctor so most of the trials have proven, especially recovery trial has proven dexamethasone of 6 mg per day for 10 days would have good outcome if started at the right time this can have serious effects as we are already seeing there is a epidemic during the pandemic that is mycormycosis when steroids have been very much misused tocilizumab uh this is an interleukin 6 blocker when what happens is when there is cytokine storm which is one of the major complications of covid-19 and almost contributing to most of the admissions happening in covid-19 to icus this has to be given for critically ill patients what happens is there is lot of cytokines many cytokines getting involved but what has been observed is il6 has a predominant role among all these cytokines this has been observed in china first but many trials have come initially they have discouraged tocilizumab but the newer evidence is suggesting good role of tocilizumab only and only if the case is selected properly even uh, a little late or uh, having a contraindication like uh, another another infection like secondary bacterial infection this page this drug can be lethal to the patient so we now after working in covid for at least a year we now know when exactly tocilizumab has to be prepared and uh, who is the right candidate for that what prior workup is needed and how do we follow patients given this medication incorrect administration can cause severe secondary infections convalescent plasma as we all know a treated patient if within 28 days of recovery and who is not vaccinated can donate plasma if he has good titers then that to neutralizing antibody antibody titers i would say just like remdesivir this also is only meant for the first week of illness in the second week in the inflammatory phase convalescent plasma is literally not useful and unfortunately most of the admitted case are not out of second week and the diagnosis itself is taking 3 to 4 days and uh, they themselves monitoring and uh, uh, give me a second and the tosili is in the yeah ah yeah abinas abinas sir I'm sorry. So, unfortunately, most of the admitted cases are of the second week. There is no concrete evidence yet of its efficacy, and I already mentioned titers are very important, which is neutralizing antibodies and not taken from mothers because mothers, after I mean, giving uh, uh, I mean, uh, married and mothers, they have these uh, HLA antibodies. which uh, for from them this plasma is not taken anticoagulation these are blood thinners very much important in covid 19 especially in hyper inflammatory response in covid 19 every patient has to be on anticoagulation because there is a pro coagulant the blood tends to uh, get viscous and create clots so every patient who is getting admitted with moderate to severe illness has to be given anticoagulation there are plenty of types that is heparin enoxaparin pandaparinox apixaban rivaroxaban and dabigatran we use based on the either injection or tablets based on the how critical the patient is and we discharge patients on anticoagulation for at least about 
one to two weeks post discharge. Antibiotics, a prophylactic antibiotics should be given in moderate to severe cases. Why? Because we try to prevent secondary infections in these patients. If already secondary infections are present, a culture will give us which antibiotic suits the patient. There are a lot of immunomodulated drugs like baricitinib, etolizumab, infliximab, and tofacitinib. Nowadays, we are using this baricitinib and tofacitinib also in this high, hyper inflammatory uh, phase. Uh, this is a Janus kinase inhibitor, which also works exactly where the cytokines get produced from. This enzyme, if it's inhibited, there are a lot of cytokines coming down. And we are having a, we are seeing a good response in some of the patients, but uh, this I would say this emerging role, and in few months down the line, everybody will have good evidence of these medications. There are some other medications which are also immunomodulators like etolizumab and infliximab. We need larger randomized controlled trials, but uh, no uh, lar uh, larger RCTs pertaining to COVID-19. Infliximab has shown good evidence in these inflammatory bowel disease patients. What happened is this inflammatory bowel disease patients, they were already on this medication for the IBD per se, but when they got COVID, they really did good and nobody actually died from COVID, in, though they are on this immunosuppressive medication. So a lot of trials are coming up and uh, there are trials presently going on on these medications. So I would summarize what exactly has to be is pertaining to this moderate to severe COVID-19 cases. The first thing is this oxygen support. I would say every COVID-19 moderate to severe, the main drug is the oxygen. We have to give, we have to buy time for the body to recover. And uh, anticoagulation for all patients, uh, because if we don't anticoagulate, definitely there are going to be clots in these patients, but it has to be balanced at what dose and are there any contraindications? If there are any contraindications, it's, uh, it depends on the doctor. He has to choose with the risk-benefit ratio. Remdesivir, only if early in the disease, it has role. In critical illness, it definitely, I don't feel there is a role of remdesivir. Antibiotics has to be given as a prophylactic to prevent secondary infections. Convalescent plasma in the first week only. Tocilizumab, Good if selected properly, it can be harmful or lethal if there is no proper selection. Paracetinib and tofacitinib, presently we are using and has good emerging role. We are seeing good results in some of the patients. I will just mention how oxygen therapy we escalate in our patients. Suppose a patient admitting with a mild hypoxemia, mild drop in oxygen, we start with this nasal prongs. As we up to five liters of oxygen, we can give with this nasal prongs. It's very comfortable, uh, no claustrophobia with this nasal prongs. If it if the need is more than five liters, we give face mask, which is up to six to ten liters. We can give with this face mask. Even if the patient is not maintaining with ten liters, we go up to more than ten liters with this non-rebreather mask, which we call it as NRBM or high concentration mask. Even after giving up to 15 liters with the flow meter on, if the patient is still not maintaining, suppose having severe COVID and lungs got affected severely, we go on to HFNC, that's called high flow nasal cannula, if that is available in the center. And if even on HFNC, if the patient is still tachypneic, like breathing around more than 30 per minute, we give a non invasive ventilation where a mask is put on the uh, face of the patient and the tubings are connected to the ventilator. Now the pressure is given with non-invasive ventilation. Uh, the fatigue of the patient can be prevented. So if we don't do this NIV in sick patients, patients will go into fatigue, the muscles of the patient will go into fatigue and the patient will suddenly land, may land up in respiratory arrest. Even on non-invasive ventilation, if the patient does not maintain, then we put the patient with an endotracheal tube, sedate and paralyze the patient and put him on this invasive ventilation. And uh, there's a lot of myth with, uh, among the patients 
uh, families that once a patient goes on invasive ventilation, there is no chance for these patients. I just want to, uh, I always tell my patients that invasive is only a uh, method to buy time for the lungs to recover. Definitely does not mean that the patient will not survive. Even on mechanical ventilation, we sometimes prone the patient, like put the patient in prone position to increase the oxygenation, which is an effective oxygenation uh, strategy. Even on that, if the patient does not maintain, we suggest the patient to go on this extracorporeal membrane oxygenator called ECMO. ECMO totally gives rest to the lungs and it will take the blood into it and bring back the blood into the patient's body uh, and total uh, and the machine will oxygenate. Now the lungs need not oxygenate the blood. So while on ECMO, it, it buys time like days or weeks also and we have sufficient time for the lungs to heal. But ECMO has its own pros and cons. It has to be right. Selection has to be proper. It can be lethal to the patient if started very late. And even on ECMO, if the patient does not maintain, and sometimes ECMO may, may not uh, also uh, help the patient, then we suggest the patient if the right indication is there and the center is capable, they can go for this lung transplantation. What's in the near future is a stem cell therapy, visacamel stem cell therapy, which a lot of trials have started, at least 20 trials have started. Two deoxyglucose, which uh, Hyderabad um, DRDO has uh, manufactured, but I really don't have any idea about this. Methylene blue, we have been using plenty, but uh, no other center has used this medication as much as we did, safer, but having good results in some of the patients. Uh, the larger studies have to be done globally to uh, know the role of methylene blue in COVID-19. We may publish our uh, findings in few months. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vishal, for a wonderful insight and like a step through various stages of uh, mild, moderate, and then severe patients. Uh, we have several questions. So uh, first one uh, I'm taking from the chat box and I'll go to the question answers now. So first one is like, how do you distinguish between uh, breathing related issues because of anxiety versus that related to COVID uh, breathlessness? Yeah, so anxiety usually does not drop the oxygenation levels. Uh, even after six minute walk test, they usually tend to maintain their oxygen levels. Very good. But a uh, little history into their uh, uh, nature, like whether they are type A or type B, from the family, they usually ask. But during a pandemic, uh, practically speaking, they all end up getting a CT scan and then only I am able to differentiate uh, through these online calls. Uh, if they are right in front of me, I can auscultate the patient and uh, do a proper test uh, before they, I advise CT scan. But uh, uh, these days, it's uh, we need to be talking to the family and checking their SpO2. And if needed, uh, we have to go for a CT scan to know the level of lung infection. If lungs are normal, I would really say that it's probably due to anxiety. So uh, from your initial slide, you said that if RT-PCR is negative, uh, we should go for CT scan only if these symptoms persist for more than five days. Is that correct? You want to elaborate on that? Yeah. If RT-PCR is negative and symptoms persist, here what I do is if already a family member is positive or the patient is aware of a close contact, I would, all, I would take him as COVID positive even without CT scan because the infectivity of COVID is really high and any close contact having symptoms is COVID unless otherwise proven. And I start the treatment and also uh, will not prefer CT scan if he is doing fine already. But is there, if there is a diagnostic dilemma, there is no clear contact, RT-PCR is negative, but symptoms are persisting, I first go for a repeat RT-PCR in the first five days. And if symptoms are already severe, I order a CT scan right away. But if symptoms are mild, I wait for five days, 
treat as a clinical covid and repeat rt pcr and after 5 days only if symptoms persist i will go for a ct scan sometimes we may have to do a ct early because in some selected patients if they are having progressive symptoms and uh, in some high risk groups where early diagnosis is what we need to prevent more complications so uh, continuing on that you said that chloride of 5 or 6 suggests that uh, there is definitely covid possibility so somebody who uh, shows a negative rt pcr but a chloride of 5 or 6 you go with covid therapy but do you recommend a follow up uh, hrct at some point uh, or you assume that the patient will recover yeah chloride 6 is actually Uh, should be removed in my view because only rt pcr being positive and lungs are totally normal still it comes under chloride 6 actually i really appeal that this term has to be removed because this is creating lot of panic what the patient tells is their sick patient is already chloride 5 now they are chloride 6 but their lungs are normal so i in my personal view on chloride 6 is it has to be removed but chloride 5 uh patients of rt pcr negative we treat it as covid only but we really do not recommend any repeat ct scan if the patient is already doing fine if at all we are repeating any ct scan that will be a scan which will detect we, where we are suspecting clots in the circulation of lungs that's called pulmonary angiogram only then we would the repeat ct to check the circulation now rather than the lungs because lungs we have already checked A repeat scans can be a simple chest X-ray, which will already give you lot of information if you have an idea of the first CT scan. And what we usually do is only chest X-rays. Okay. So uh, you also mentioned that there are blood thinners which are given simultaneously with the therapy for COVID patient, and even post recovery, like you try to continue that for a couple of weeks. is there a th- threshold or any guidelines on that guidelines have come up uh, where uh, they are recommending at least two weeks of uh, this blood uh, blood thinner prophylaxis but if we cannot go by just uh, number of weeks it has to be customized to each patient suppose i have a patient of very very high d dimer levels but thrombosis i could not prove where the clot happened in the body i would go with a longer duration of anticoagulation in that patient just thinking that probably there was thrombosis somewhere and i would monitor their d dimer levels and make a decision but overall you know most of the patients who are not fitting into this category a two weeks post discharge of anticoagulation i would say would be necessary right so um lot of these fungal infections are related to steroid is there an alternate therapy to steroid usage very very nice question sir actually in second week steroids uh, are giving lot of side effects but a similar therapy like i would have already mentioned this baricitinib which is a janus kinase inhibitor where lot of studies are there combining remdesivir and only baricitinib and no steroid have shown lot of improvement but what happens is when a patient comes the first obviously the the tendency of the protocol or the doctor is to first initiate on steroid to see whether the patient would improve if not they tend to add the next uh, line of medications but uh, not removing the steroid or let just at least reducing the dose of steroid there is only a lot of hesitancy among patient psychology and doctors because lot of information has gone into patient's hand lot of every therapy every patient family is aware of the treatment going on so with lot of constraints like this especially when everybody is aware of what is going on there is a tendency not to stop these medications so there has to be complete strict protocols to avoid any steroid misuse and uh, uh a doctor should not be influenced a lot by patient family or like that uh, i i uh, i hope that you are getting what doctors are going through during this pandemic 
so there are a lot of other medications but still there are a lot of evidence needed to implement it as a standard of care for all covid 19 patients so uh, one of the level of anxiety is among the covid recovered patients because they have been hearing news that uh, if they had gone through steroid uh, therapy there are chances that their sugar level may fluctuate even though they were non diabetic to start with so what is your recommendation they should go for some therapy or some tests and things like that uh, all the patients who are being given steroid uh, protocols or hospitals will monitor their sugar levels and control them because strict glycemic control is what is needed to prevent complications like any bacterial infections or fungal infections so taking steroids per se definitely will not risk the patient for these complications provided that they monitor these uh, whatever is necessary for any patient on steroid like especially sugars steroids have been used for ages for multiple conditions in high doses almost 1 gram methylphenicillone in most of the every department or like i use 1 gram for a certain type of patients especially in rheumatological uh, uh, conditions never actually there was this much of panic only when coming here uh, only in the recent times when this fungal infections have increased there is a panic and every patient is now again hesitant to start steroid with this new epidemic which is going on but i feel they are if they if rightly used in the right doses they are really life saving and uh, there should be no hesitancy in starting steroid in covid 19 if the patient is fitting the criteria so you mentioned this about the uh, patient treated in hospital what about those under home isolation but still undergone through steroid therapy like uh, maybe they have taken uh, some uh, like <clears throat> nebulizer based steroid at home itself should they be worried about post covid recovery symptoms and things like that no no you need not worry about any post covid uh, uh, complications nebulized steroid has very minimal side effects it's been the standard of treatment for uh, bronchial asthma and copd and many other post infective uh, treatments post infect post infective cough and breathing difficulty what we call it as hyper reactive airway so whoever is taking steroids at home if it was rightly started by their doctor uh in view of bed scarcity like if at all there was an indication of steroid ideally they have to be given in the hospital but due to the present pandemic situation uh, there is a tendency by the government also to start steroids uh, during home isolation only thinking that they may go for a cytokine storm or inflammatory syndrome so in that case also they need not be worried when it is started at a very decent dosages which is recommended misuse of steroid is like when it's not needed it is given or it's given at the right time but in very high doses this is what has to be avoided so <clears throat> one of the follow up question is like uh, for patients which were uh, like copd or bronchial asthma patient if they have undergone through covid and recovered do you um, like are there literature or from indian condition some evidence that they have been experiencing more episodes of asthma after this uh, because of weakage their lungs are weaker or something like that definitely not uh, i have discharged this upd patients uh, many upd patients with covid 19 and they are really good, doing good better than who actually do not have a copd so okay. it depends on each person each patient but uh, definitely covid 19 is not going to make their asthma or copd worse any infection would per se increase the uh, symptoms of asthma their control would uh, i mean it will be poorly controlled for few days so whenever a patient with asthma or copd gets any viral infection be it be covid or any h1n1 or anything we actually optimize the treatment or increase the dosages of the medications for a time being and once they recover we come back to the regular dosages of these medicines i would really say that they need not be worried about and getting cold so a related question i see it's a long one i'll read out for persisting cough a month after covid recovery can mucolytics like mucinac be taken do they have any serious side effects 
i know self medication should be discouraged but to but access to medical professionals offline is very limited in our area so patient is taking buto uh, sconite uh, sorry inhaler under doctor's prescription but some amount of mucus is still present in the respiratory tract so i don't know I mean, if you want to answer that yeah mucinac is very safe i already mentioned in my uh, presentation that nestal cysteine has got some antiviral and uh, it has a role in anti preventing this micro thrombi this got micro clots also so it is safe even during covid and post covid and it definitely has got a lot of mucolytic action it thins the mucus not just thinning mucus is important they need to do some respiratory exercises to get it out uh, this incentive spirometer is what i suggest for all post covid patients to get the mucus out and the, so the lungs get clean and uh, uh, there is good uh, proper oxygenation okay. so um, again like a general question is like a lot of people say that if they have got one shot and if they still develop covid like uh, uh, people are confused like uh, are they still infectious to other people because they were supposed to have antibodies in their blood so what is happening one shot of vaccine right yeah so if somebody has taken one shot of vaccine and after say one month or two month they get this uh, covid rtpcr is positive right yeah if at least sufficient time has been over since the first shot um, then uh, after if they get covid at least they would have some immunity from the vaccine and once they recover uh, during covid they are treated really like any other covid infection they can be infectious to any other uh, just like any other patient about treatment and infectivity it applies the same as long as you are proven covid 19 but uh, when to take the second shot is after at least 6 to 8 weeks you can take 8 weeks after recovery from the actual covid infection but if the infection has come very near after taking the first dose like just within 4 5 days or even during vaccine some have some already had symptoms i would say that the first shot really doesn't work so they have to repeat the second so they have to repeat the first shot after eight weeks of recovery and then again with the recommended gap they have to go for the second shot okay uh, one question which i missed in between was uh, this mucomyc mucoromycosis uh, this fungal infection is it largely due to steroid use or there are other uh, reasons for it to it like be an yes epidemic stage yeah actually i have a Um, I have a like, talk on this this one hour at seven o'clock. Uh, yeah. The thing is, uh, uh, maybe this has to be investigated from where these uh, mucous mycoses have cases have come. Lot of uh, good hospitals with uh, good oxygen facilities uh, really are not uh, who have been managed with very good facilities are not having these uh, symptoms or these complications. steroid definitely is contributing to misuse of steroid mucor mycosis happens in those severely immunocompromised patients like transplant patients uh, leukemia uh, cancer patients uh, these patients on chemotherapy these patients suffer from mucor mycosis but why are why are these covid patients suffering from mucor because covid is itself not a immunocompromised state they have been made immunocompromised by this high dosage of steroids you uh, being used at uh, uh, some some uh, centers i would say it it is not prop i mean maybe the doctors are not aware of the right uh, protocols uh, this misuse is happening but in my view that there is something else uh, for this uh, epidemic going on of this fungal infection maybe the oxygen delivery or uh, uh, from where exactly the Uh, water being used in the moisture i mean the o2 flow meters is this distilled water or is it just tap water or where are these cylinders are they being rightly cleaned uh, what is the uh, they have to there have to be uh, case studies uh, on these cases and uh, try to find out the exact cause of these uh, cases so there are some other reasons where their high ferritin levels promote uh, 
development of mucor but high ferritin was there in first wave also but why only in the second wave we are having i feel the difference from the first wave is the steroids were all misused in the first wave the high ferritin was there in the first wave what's different here is i in my view i don't have any evidence of this the oxygen delivery the oxygen shortage the cylinders are being circulated from where is this coming what is the so this has to be focused in my view right in your presentation uh, you showed the efficacy of different uh, medicines including some vitamins so uh, can you elaborate on vitamin d you said like the dosage should be very high uh, i could not get that thinking these are studies which have not been yet uh, uh, proven in la very large rcts um, mega doses of vitamin d there is a separate book available on uh, this a lot of experts i know who have been using this mega doses of vitamin d but it has its own side effects uh, maybe in few years time this mega doses of vitamin d effects on these multiple diseases we may have evidence and incorporated into protocols but uh, vitamin d per se if somebody is deficient we suggest a 60000 dose of one per week and for 8 weeks and then a maintenance dose of 60000 i u every month so this is the right recommendation which is covid patients can presently use okay one general question uh, for physicians like you who work day in and day out at the icu and deal with so much panic and like uh, all this chaotic movement in front of you how do you keep yourself calm and like sane so <laughs> i would always um uh, uh, moment i go home i become a little slow but as soon as i step in the hospital the walking the thinking everything becomes so fast so this is what i observe daily uh, maybe because we are used to this type of uh, work for years together even during uh, uh, when we clear uh, this this stress is very common for uh, medical professional but uh, uh i would say there's nothing much we are doing to keep ourselves calm during this pandemic because every minute we are uh, having calls or uh, so only colleagues uh, and meet meeting uh, meeting our colleagues and discussing cases is what is uh, our way of uh, little distressing uh, if without colleagues i would say this <laughs> is calming down and uh, this thing will not happen of course family support uh, is definitely there organization support is definitely there and um, i would say is nothing much specific maybe we are used to this type of work so thank you very much i think for taking your time off i know like you are so busy but uh, we have enormous benefits from your presentation uh this has gone on uh, youtube live so this video will be remaining there some of uh, the audience have asked for the slides so we will uh, separately get back to them if uh, where those should be available so i from all the audience and from iit kanpur uh, fraternity i wholeheartedly thank you dr vishal kumar for uh, sharing like in depth all the things which were very very we were curious about and anxious about and uh, hopefully this will uh, improve the situation i wish you all the best for the all the hard work that your team and doctors all over the country are working very hard to make sure that our country is back on its normal course thank you very much thank you so much sir so my my uh, message uh, would be that there was uh, i feel uh, that uh, uh, adequate uh, number of studies or uh, adequate research has not been taken up by uh, uh, say by the government or so more, many of the studies or observations that have to be taken up uh, yeah, by the government itself to know which drug works or which does not work and um, i say that any patient who gets symptoms they have to be lot of awareness who has to identify their symptoms and easy access to 
specialist or the covid 19 specialist the system has to be set in even with having a smartphone uh, they the system the standard operating protocols once somebody has symptom they has to be for that the standard operating protocol once somebody has uh, proven covid 19 so there has to be a sop set each step and easy access to every patient with the specialist uh, if this can be done then the morbidity and mortality i feel strongly that can we can bring that to zero all the mortality or those patients ending up in the icus there is only two and two reasons why they are uh, uh, ending up either somebody has mismanaged their treatment or they themselves mismanaged their care these are the only two reasons why there is mortality i strongly believe that covid 19 is not a serious disease if it is properly managed and properly monitored the mortality can be as low as zero this is my message thank you so much thank you thank you all for joining and